This is the Monday, October 12th, 2015 episode of the History Authors Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new episode every Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline, on the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys, oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. This is The History Author Show, and I'm your host, Dean Carianis. Thank you for joining us on our iHeartRadio channel, iTunes, Spreaker, or one of the many other places our show is available. We have a great interview for you today, and I hope you'll want to spread the word about it. Why? Because it's about a legend most of us think we know, but we usually don't have the full story about. The name Sir Winston Spencer Churchill invokes the cigar-chomping, resolute, defiant, scowling British bulldog. The balding statesman who stood alone against Hitler in World War II, leading the British people to eventually overtake Adolf Hitler. We've seen him touting the Tommy gun and flashing the V for victory sign so many times, it's easy to forget that he was already in his mid-60s when he became prime minister. He had a long career behind him already by that point. Churchill said that 20 to 25 were the key years in a person's life. And it's this young Winston that's the topic of Simon Reed's new book, Winston Churchill Reporting, Adventures of a Young War Correspondent. Simon Reed is an award-winning reporter and author in his own right, by the way. You can follow him at Simon Reed Books on Twitter, or check out his website at simon-reed.com. It's hard to overestimate just how important Churchill's career as a war correspondent was to the man he became, and that man saved the world. Churchill not only honed his command of the English language that in time would move whole armies and encourage the people of Western Europe to rise up against their Nazi oppressors, but Churchill also developed his views of warfare and of diplomacy, the diplomacy that after the Second World War helped him avoid the mistakes of the Treaty of Versailles and gave us a peace in Europe that has lasted till this day. And also, it was this career as a war correspondent that enabled Churchill to go and win a seat in Parliament when he stood for the second time. And that launched a career that took him straight to 10 Downing Street, although it took him a while to get there. Winston Churchill reporting chronicles the period between 1895 and 1900, when Churchill globetrotted to such hotspots as Cuba, India, the Sudan, and South Africa. And when I say hotspots, I mean there were real shooting wars going on in these places. Churchill ran to the sound of the guns. This is my favorite period of history, Churchill's one of my favorite people, and this is one of my favorite periods of his life. So I hope you enjoy my interview with Simon Reed as much as I did. Here we go, Winston Churchill reporting, Adventures of a Young War Correspondent. I'm on the line with Simon Reed, author of Winston Churchill reporting, Adventures of a Young War Correspondent. Thanks for joining me today, Simon. Dean, thanks for having me. Great to be here. I was very glad to get the book in my hands. There's just so much to chew on with Winston Churchill, and you put a lot of it in Winston Churchill reporting without sort of walking over ground that's been tread a thousand times, and there's, you know, no grass growing on it, you know, those spots in parks. (laughs) That's how (laughs) Churchill's scholarship can feel like a lot. And I think whether you're a writer, journalist, or you just love history, you just admire Churchill— you get so much out of this book and that's not an easy thing to do to appeal to both the person who maybe never picked up a Churchill book before or the person who's read 30 Churchill books, which you could easily do in your life. There's, there's literally thousands of them. And so I wanted to ask you in that environment, that's awash with books on Churchill's life. How did you meet this challenge of saying something unique? Well, you know, a, a lot of books on Churchill tend to cover his life in its entirety. And because the man had such an amazing life, those books have to paint in very broad brushstrokes just because there is so much information to convey. But what you tend to see now with Churchill are what I call microbiographies. And those aren't books that are 
short in length, but they're books that focus on a specific part of Churchill's life and then do a deep dive on it. And I'm thinking of books like Young Titan by Michael Sheldon, which covers his early political career. And then there's a great book by uh, David Reynolds called In Command of History that chronicles the years Churchill spent writing his World War II memoirs. But obviously when you think of Churchill, what always comes to mind is Churchill the war leader and everything that sort of entails, you know, the ever-present cigar, the never-surrender spirit, this unshakable belief in the righteousness of the British Empire, and obviously these amazing speeches that 70 years on still pack an emotional punch. And I've always kind of been curious, like, what sort of shaped this figure that has been lionized, you know, this giant icon in history? What kind of created this man that we, we remember in this way? And I think when you go back through Churchill's life and you look at everything he did, you know, as you said, I mean, the man just led an amazing life. When you look at everything he did, I think the most formative period in his life, and this is obviously just my personal opinion, but I think the most formative period in his life are the years he spent as a war correspondent between 1895 and 1900. And during those years, he worked for various newspapers and covered various wars of empire. You know, he was in Cuba covering the Cuban uprising against Spanish colonial rule. He uh, saw combat on India's northwest frontier. He saw combat in the deserts of uh, Sudan. And then he sort of ultimately made a name for himself on the battlefields of South Africa during the Second Boer War. And the reason I think that period is so important is you see a lot of Churchill's key traits take shape during those years. You know, in Cuba, he discovers his love of cigars. On the Northwest frontier, where the most palatable thing for a British soldier to drink was whiskey, Churchill discovers the love of that libation. And even more importantly, during this period, we see Churchill hone his incredible command of the English language through the newspaper articles that he wrote, and also through the books that he wrote. He turned his war corresponding years into a great writing career. And I think to understand Churchill, the icon that he became, to better understand that figure, you sort of have to understand Churchill, the young adventurer. And, you know, like you said, Dean, there are so many books on Churchill. When you write about Churchill, you're not necessarily going to uncover any new facts, but I think you can present Churchill in a new light. And so the idea with this book was to present Churchill as a young adventurer. When I was writing the book, I described it to friends as Winston Churchill, as Indiana Jones. And although the book has elements of history, it's got elements of biography, first and foremost, in my mind, it's an adventure story. You know, it's an action adventure story, and it moves very fast. I wanted it to have, you know, a fast moving pace. And so I hope people who maybe have read a lot of books on Churchill, come away thinking, oh, well, I've never sort of seen Churchill in this light before. And I hope people who haven't read anything on Churchill come away wanting to read more. You said it's just my opinion that those are the key years in his life. Well, it occurred to me, it's not just your opinion. You happen to share it with Winston Churchill, right? Who said 20 to 25. Ah, those those are, the, are years. the years, right. <laughs> person, he went at life. He was one of those people and you know them and you usually wish you were more like them. And you say, gosh, so driven, knows at a young age what they want to go out and do. Mm-hmm. Keep in mind, this is a time for people listening that the British Empire is at peace. And here's a young man who realizes, well, I've got to get and see some action somehow. And he's traveling all around the world. Think about it. Late, We're talking the late 1800s. Right. So this is not a time you just hop on a plane to get to India or Sudan or South Africa or Cuba. And these are all war areas. Think of what it's like today to get into a place like Syria. This is the place that he would be going. This is not easy. And a lot of biographies, I think, they look at Churchill's book, My Early Life, and they sort of do a little summary of that. And that's all the treatment that they give to his young life. Right. Whereas he was really writing that to speak to the young people of Britain at the time. He's writing that, is it in the 30s, I believe? Or? Early early 30s, mid 30s, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So he was writing it to say, hey, I did it. You can do it. And in fact, recently I was reading the book God and Churchill by our mutual friend, Jonathan Sands, who's right. Churchill's great grandson. I believe it was in the forward, something like when we look at Churchill, we feel like we're pygmies. And it reminded me of uh-huh. the song that Churchill was used to sing at the Harrow School when he was a boy. It was his favorite school song that you may know. I will not attempt to sing it. But the (laughs) boys went and sang it. He went and visited Harrow in the middle of the Second World War. And 
one of the lines in the song always struck me, and that was that all these amazing things that the Giants of old did that they threw to 100 yards or more. They were never lame or stiff or sore. And we are all cast in a pygmy mold compared to the Giants of old. And then the last line really spoke to sort of this young Churchill. And it was basically that, well, I think that that's all sort of pulling our leg, having us on, because all of we, whoever we be, measure up to the Giants of old, you see. It's something very close to that, I think. <laughs> and anyway, they use the word pygmy there it's sort of to say how we feel. And we do feel like that looking at Churchill. When you look at him as a young man, you say, gosh, so much of these things couldn't possibly have happened. But yet he really did them. And he downplayed it a little in that in my early life. And I think that's been the tendency of subsequent biographers was to sort of play it down a little bit and not talk about all the amazing things he did. Right. You know, when you read My Early Life, it's a wonderful book. I mean, it's so entertaining. It's lighthearted. His wit really comes through. And you also see just what a brilliant storyteller he is. But he does leave out a tremendous amount of detail of what he actually went through on these various excursions to battlefields. And when I was doing the research, you know, I was obviously looking at the letters that he wrote home and at the newspaper articles that he wrote. And I think when we think of war in the 1800s, you know, we sort of think of it as this, you know, we might have a romantic view of it, that it was almost a civil affair. But the experiences he went through, some of them were quite horrific and barbaric. The fighting on the northwest frontier was particularly savage. His experiences in uh, Omdurman in the Sudan were extraordinary. You know, he took part in one of the last great cavalry charges in, in British military history, and his account of that is just absolutely fantastic. And yet, it is downplayed in my early life. And you're absolutely right. You know, when you look at what Churchill did in those years, 20 to 25, you know, the books he wrote, the articles he wrote, the experiences that he went through, even today, you can't help but be absolutely amazed. And it does sort of make you feel like an underachiever. Um, but yeah, I, I you think, have to. You, you have to. But I think with Churchill, as you know, he had a great sense of his own destiny, and he believed that he was destined for greatness. And he, you know, he pursued that greatness. He didn't sit by and wait for it to happen. He was very proactive. And so, you know, he, he went on these adventures with an end game in sight, which was to make a public name for himself and establish himself in politics, but he was not someone just to wait around for life to hand him something. He went out and pursued it. That's a lesson that young people can follow today. Yeah, you said destiny, and I wasn't sure that I mentioned the name of Jonathan Sand's book, but it is God and Churchill. And he talks a lot about that, about his sense of destiny, really, that he had, Churchill, growing up, and he was going to go out and achieve it and find it. And he writes so many of those letters as a young person. And as we said, you just can't believe it. And so when you're there writing Winston Churchill reporting, there's got to be a temptation to sort of say, okay, let me just find a way to relate that. And yet you have to tell the truth. Churchill was able to write My Early Life, and he could downplay some things like his escape from the prisoner of war camp. And when you know the real story that he was able to tell beyond My Early Life, right. it's you could see he changed some details because he didn't want to get anybody in trouble at the time That's right. living under South Africa. And you say, wow, this is Wiley. He changed this in there. And so I was thinking when you wrote this book, that must have been a challenge. And not only that, but there's so much ground that is more well covered. For instance, the relationship with his parents. And when I started reading Winston Churchill reporting, I remember I emailed you right away and I said, Simon, you had this great line in here where you said, Churchill's father, Randolph, called him a wonderfully pretty baby. And you said that, quote, this was one of the kindest things he ever said about his son. Right. And then you moved on. And I thought that that economy of words to invoke that distant relationship that we all know about, it's almost like the origin story of a superhero that we're so <laughs> familiar with on TV, right? We know what happens with Superman when he gets Krypton's falling apart. And we know Batman and parents in the alley both get shot. Like, it, how many more times do you need to see it in right. every new movie? And I thought that that was one way that you clearly dealt with a challenge. And another thing, though, that you decided you did need to spend time on was this sort of myth that Churchill was independently wealthy, and he wasn't. So part of the motivation for all this action was he needed to make his fortune, didn't he? 
He did. He did. You know, it was a Churchill family trait that they loved to spend money. Churchill's parents, Lord and Lady Randolph, definitely liked to spend beyond their means. They were social animals. Lady Randolph threw very elegant parties. She was in demand as a hostess. She was in demand as a lover. She was a very elegant, beautiful woman. Churchill's father, Lord Randolph, History has not been kind to him, and rightfully so. You know, when we talk about him as a father figure, he was very cold and distant. You mention uh, how I sort of relate the relationship between Churchill and his father. You know, when I was writing the book, I was very much aware that I'm writing for two very different audiences, and I've never been aware of that when writing a book before. But when I was writing uh, Churchill Reporting, uh, I was aware that I'm writing for people who've read a lot of books on Churchill and know about the relationship between Churchill and his father. And then I'm writing for people who may not have read any books on Churchill and might not be entirely familiar with sort of the relationship between the two. But, you know, as you said, Ch Churchill's father was very cold and distant. I, you know, I think by today's standards, we'd even say he was emotionally abusive, maybe even verbally abusive. I mean, you know, the things he said about his son and to his son were were horrendous. That letter, you know, he wrote that letter to, um, I think it was his mother-in-law, you know, just right after Churchill was born. And I think, if I remember correctly, the line he writes, the boy is pretty, or so I've been told. It, 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 was, it was kind of like this very throwaway line. And when I saw that, I was thinking, well, I'm a father to two young boys. And on the nights that they were born, you know, I, you know, I, I held each one in my arms and I looked down at them and they were the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. I mean, I was, it was like mad love at first sight. And yet you have Lord Randolph writing this total throwaway line about his kid. And yeah, he's wonderfully pretty or so people tell me. And I thought that just set a great, that really establishes the tone and demeanor of the relationship that Churchill and his father had. And I think Churchill's life in a lot of ways was just trying to live up to his father's expectations. I mean, Churchill never ever did anything that pleased his father. You know, when Churchill went to Sandhurst and got into the cavalry, you know, Lord Randolph was furious because the cavalry cost more to join than the infantry, and he viewed the cavalry as second-rate soldiers. And nothing Churchill did ever, ever pleased the man. And so, you know, there's a story I've heard that later in life, Mary Churchill, you know, Churchill's youngest daughter, said to him at some point, you know, when Churchill was reaching the end of his life, is there anything that you regret? And Churchill said, yes, you know, I, I regret that my father never lived to see me accomplish anything. And to me, that is incredibly sad that a man who accomplished everything Churchill did can at the end of his life still feel the bitter disappointment of his father's sort of failed expectations. And so I think Churchill was always sort of striving for that acceptance from his father. And in terms of going back to the money, Churchill's sort of desire to be a war correspondent, you know, there were a couple of factors at play. Number one, it was to make a name for himself, to go into a career in politics and sort of live up to what his father expected from him. But you're absolutely right. Secondly, it was to make money. Churchill had very expensive tastes and he had a small bank account and, uh, you know, he needed cash to live up to uh, the Churchill family standards. Yeah, we often forget, I think, because he looks like a man of such means. But this is a great time to meet him, I think. You'd want to hang out with that guy. He's younger than both of us at this time in the book, 21 and famously coming under fire for the first time in Cuba as a mm -hmm. correspondent. But he was also a guy that would probably be saying, gosh, can I afford this next round? <laughs> or what's the cheapest place to get a, to get a drink in Cuba at this time of night? This kind of thing. That, But yet he had to present this facade to the world and he wanted to live up to it. And one of the great things I loved in Winston Churchill reporting is you slow down and kind of go through that part of, oh, hey, mother, he writes her a letter and says, I need 500 pounds or whatever it is to because I'm going to go off to Cuba because I've taken this job as a correspondent. And she says, what? Yeah. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't even ask me before. And now you're also asking me for money, which she was loath to part with, I guess you'd say. Yep. And so that's all a young man. And I think for any person, whether you're a journalist, as I said, or whether you're a writer, or whether you're just a young person looking for your place in life, this book gives people a lot of examples to follow. 
He wanted to be able to be an example, maybe because he didn't have that with his father, as you're talking about. And so he pushed himself to become a war correspondent. He was always sort of acting as if to build his resume and to build that confidence and to kind of show his father, who passed away when he was young, as he was what, um, 19? Passed away um, just before he joined the cavalry. It was in December, I believe, 1894, I want to say. Yeah, I think it was 20, you know, about a year before he set off for Cuba. Okay. And a lot of these little details, too, I want to mention to the listeners, things like that about Randolph saying he was a beautiful baby, so I'm told. Those things, as you said, talking to the person who's read a bunch of Churchill books or the person who didn't, for the person that didn't, there's so many things in Winston Churchill reporting that will make them want to go pick up another book on Churchill. Maybe they'll want to go pick up Jonathan Sand's book, who, yes, we are going to hear from. I'm going to definitely interview Jonathan soon for when that book comes out. I wanted to mention also the cover art because we talked about that. We're sort of in a unique position here for the listeners because we spent so many months talking about the book in the lead up and your research and trading old 1901 pictures of Churchill back and forth. If you people think that that's not fun for us, then (laughs) I don't know Simon or myself, but (laughs) you had a couple of versions of the cover and the current one, I just wanted you to mention that picture. The picture is funny, not your book cover. (laughs) The cover went through two iterations. The one that you received, the sort of advanced reader copy that went out, that's a picture of Churchill you know, as a war correspondent in South Africa. You know, it's a wonderful picture. He's standing there uh, in the entranceway to uh, his canvas tent out in the middle of a field. His hands are placed on his hip, and he's looking very sternly right into the camera. And it's a wonderful picture of a young man on the make. You know, you can see his determination. You can see his self-confidence. There's nothing diminutive about him. You know, he's very... uh, He's fully present, let's put it that way. He's chomping at the bit for something to happen. And that was the image that went on the advanced reader copy. But they redesigned the cover for the actual release. And the new cover of the book is fantastic. It's still a picture of Churchill during his years in South Africa. It's a great image of him wearing a slouch, you know, one of these like big South African slouch hats. There's actually kind of an Indiana Jones-ish quality to it when yeah, I look at it. Is. Yeah, and then there's kind of like a faded image down at the bottom of you see like troops fording a river and there's jungle vines sort of creeping in around from the binding of the book. But to me, both pictures are fantastic because, like I said, you know, when we think of Churchill, we tend to think of him as prime minister, war leader when, you know, he's in his senior years and he was 65 when he entered Downing Street and he's sort of more portly and, uh, you know, not as yeah. thin as he once was. When you see these... The red hair is gone. The hair is gone, you know. <laughs> so when my wife saw the pictures that they were using for the cover, she went, oh my God, is that him? <laughs> because it's so against or what we usually picture. He's young, he's athletic looking, and you know, like I said, part of the thing I wanted with this book was to present Churchill in a light that a lot of people aren't familiar with, and uh, I think the uh, book cover does a great job in doing that. The picture, he's really making eye contact with you across more than a century. He's somebody that if you saw him in a group, you would say, well, that guy clearly has something about him, and he had that quality. One of the things about the picture, though, the funny thing was the mustache. If oh, you yes. Look very yeah. closely at the cover <laughs> of Simon's book. And if you follow Simon at Simon Reed Books or me at History Dean, you will already have seen us trade this picture back and forth at the cover of the book. But he has this very thin mustache. Churchill was almost hairless of all the things that he had <laughs> in, in his in his young life, never mind when he was older and bald. At this point in his life, in Winston Churchill reporting, he has this shock of red hair and he's very young and kind of freckly looking, I guess. And the mustache, he just tried to grow it, tried to grow it, because in his mind, that was the what you looked like at the period, and he just couldn't really grow it. And it's one of the earliest, if not the earliest, examples of this quick wit that he had, where a woman at a dinner party tells him, Mr. Churchill, I don't like your politics or your mustache. And he says to her, well, I see no reason, madam, why you should ever come in contact with either. <laughs> And that's what I think when I look at that. But he wanted, when he wrote My Early Life and when he wrote these dispatches, to bring people along with him. And you capture that. You capture sort of this embedded journalist period of his life. That's what we would call him today. 
And I wanted to ask you about that 21st birthday that we just mentioned, because that's a phase right there in the cover. Tell people who don't know the significance of that 21st birthday that Winston Churchill spends with Spanish troops in Cuba. Right. Well, uh, like I said, he's in Cuba. He's covering the uh, Cuban uh, rebellion against Spanish colonial rule. And so, yeah, he turns 21 in the middle of the Cuban jungle. And, you know, it's hot, it's humid, it's fetid, the jungle sort of encroaching in on all sides. And it really favored Cubans who could launch sort of hit and run raids against the Spanish columns working their way through the vegetation. Guerrilla warfare, which Churchill had no respect for. He was a history of lover. He was raised on stories of Napoleon. To him, war was two great armies meeting in an open field beneath unfurling flags and cannons booming. So he wasn't, he did not quite know what to make of these uh, hit and run raids. But he'd gone to Cuba looking for adventure. And on the morning of his 21st birthday, he and a fellow British Army officer whom he traveled to Cuba with are uh, setting out with the Spanish troops and they get on their horses and they take their position up in the Spanish column and at the end of the column, some yards back, there comes the sound of gunfire and Cuban forces have rushed out of the undergrowth and are shooting at the Spanish troops. And so, really, on, on the morning of Churchill's 21st birthday, it's the first time he comes under enemy fire. And up until that point, war to him had been this great adventure, a game, but suddenly he realizes that, oh, there's a chance I could get injured or killed. And so suddenly some of the lightheartedness goes out of it. And he realizes that perhaps pursuing wars and going off to conflict zones isn't necessarily the smartest thing to do, as there is a real risk that something could happen. But he was really hooked on the, on the adrenaline of war. He liked the excitement of it. And... He was always curious as to how he might hold up under enemy fire. To him, war was the ultimate test of one's courage, you know, rightfully so. And, and courage to him was the ultimate benchmark by which you judged another human being. If a man wasn't courageous, then what did he have? And so he found that he sort of endured well under enemy fire. And so sort of his taste for war was sort of increased, but people sort of dismissed Churchill, his critics dismissed Churchill as a warmonger, like, oh, he loved war. But I think it's important to note, you know, when we talk about Churchill, he did enjoy the thrill of combat. He was enthralled by the complexity and scope of war and the human drama, but he actually did hate the human cost. And he had very little respect for generals that just sent soldiers into combat without a game plan or just sacrificed good men. So there were elements of war that he enjoyed. There were elements of war that he hated. But to say he was a warmonger is to sort of oversimplify his stance on the subject. And, and I will say, Dean, you know, in, in my early life, he actually, there's a great part where he's talking about he reaches some camp with the Spanish soldiers one night and he and some other Spanish soldiers are sleeping in a small shack that they've found in a jungle clearing and the Cuban rebels attack this clearing and, and bullets are coming through the walls of the shack and Churchill's first impulse is to roll out of his hammock and flatten himself against the floor for cover but none of the Spanish troops do that so he just sort of stays in the hammock and he takes comfort in the fact that between his hammock and the wall where the bullets are coming through, there's a gentleman of rather rotund proportions, we shall say. And so Churchill <laughs> figures a bullet will hit him, will hit that man before Churchill himself is struck. And he has this line in my early life that says, I have never been prejudiced against fat men. Which, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he has a lot of great lines in that book. And you recount so many of those in Winston Churchill reporting. One of them was about the Boer War, as you're saying, fighting that war. I mean, that was unpopular. We forget it now, or at least the price was unpopular. And maybe if unpopular is the wrong thing to say, certainly it was shocking to the British people, the cost of it. And his criticism of that war didn't earn him any friends, certainly, yeah. in the British government that he sought to join. And he was one of those figures that's unique, that just tells the truth, no matter the cost. If it's a truth like that, where, hey, we're sending these guys here and we're fighting these farmers who really should be our friends and they have incredible eyesight for one thing right. and they are really good marksmen, therefore. And 
Everybody's thinking, well, it's just going to be a walk in the park. As I said, the British Empire is at peace before this. And he has this great line, and Churchill says, anytime somebody tells you a war is going to be easy, just remember that there wouldn't be a war at all if the other fellow didn't think he had a chance. Exactly. And yeah. that's certainly not something a warmonger would say, right? Right. So that proves that point. It's hard because he did have to lead a war. What are you going to do? I don't know how people think. Certainly it wouldn't have been better if he'd surrendered to the Nazis. And so he had to beat the drum for the martial spirit of Britain. Right. And I think a lot of times we forget just how human he was. And I appreciate you bringing that out here. Yeah. In his war dispatches, he, especially, you know, in South Africa, the Battle of Spion Cop. Spion Cop was a mountain plateau that British troops tried to take. It was an absolute slaughterhouse. It was just brutal, savage fighting. And Churchill just, he was appalled by what he saw. He thought it was a poor strategy. He thought the battle was poorly executed. And in his war dispatches, he does not hide his disdain. He sort of lambasts the uh, British generals who ran the battle, but he sings the praises of the British troops who did the fighting. And he also sort of sings the praises of the Boers as well. You know, regardless of the side that soldiers were fighting on, Churchill had great respect for courage under fire and sort of bravery in combat. But the Boer War was a real surprise, I think. To, you know, it's not only Churchill and the soldiers who fought it, but like you said, the British public at large, they weren't fighting primitive tribes in some distant mountain land. They were fighting organized soldiers with modern-day weapons, and the blood toll was pretty horrendous. You can sort of look at the Boer War as a prologue to sort of the carnage of the First World War. Churchill, after Spion Cop, he writes to a lady friend of his at the time and says it was the most disturbing bloodletting that he'd ever seen. But the thing with Churchill is, like you said, he sort of criticizes the government that he's trying to, that he wants to eventually be a part of. You know, that's, I think, one of Churchill's great legacies is that he never said anything to sort of advance his own goals. He always said what he meant and he meant what he said. You know, I think in Winston Churchill reporting, you see that Churchill is a man of great physical courage, but he's also a man of great moral courage. He said things even if he knew they weren't going to be popular, but if he believed them to be right, he said it and he stood by it. And I, I think that's something that's sorely lacking in politicians today especially a politician that's only in his early 20s or a person, never right. mind what your job is. You know, if you're a journalist, again, or a writer, he has lessons for anybody, even if it's not directly tied to this. And I think that's why maybe there is a base human impulse to try to pull that person down. For instance, you compare him to Indiana Jones and kick yourself, I guess, a little bit after because yep. it sounds like such a movie thing and it right. discounts him a little bit. But it's very fair because... Churchill did these amazing things. One publisher that I had sent a piece to, he sent it back and he said, he reads like a comic book character. Nobody does this. I think it was about his escape from the prisoner of war camp right. and he goes down. And I, I said, well, that's basically what people thought in his life was that he did things. Oh, you didn't do that. Right. The, when he's escaping from this place. He's a correspondent. He ends up in the POW camp. He goes down in a coal mine and, he, and there's rats crawling all over him. And they tell him, well, make sure you put your candle under your pillow. And he forgets, right? And they take it. So he's down there for another two days with no light at all because the rats ate his candle. And he said there were these little, what was it? White rats with pink eyes. Or, yeah. Pink eyes. Yes. Yeah. And so they said, well, that didn't happen. We're saying here in the future that he downplayed it. They're saying he built himself up. Well, they went back to that coal mine, however many years later, a lot of years later, and they found the descendants of those same mice down there. And they said, wow, he really did spend all those days in this deep coal mine being crawled all over by rats to try to get his freedom. Is there one of those, did he really do this moments that's in this book that you really was exciting for you to write? I think my favorite chapter to write in the book was the Battle of Omdurman, which took place on September 2nd, 1898, when he took part in the charge of the 21st Lancers, one of the last great charges in British military history. And he and his 350 cavalrymen, they're riding across the desert against this army, which is an uh, Islamic army, which has sort of risen up against British sovereignty in the region. And they're charging what they think is a line of several hundred enemy warriors. But as they close in, they realize that there's a depression behind this line of warriors that they see. And in this depression are, you know, a couple of thousand. And you have 350 
cavalrymen charging forward on their steeds at a full gallop and they suddenly see thousands of shiny pointed spears being lowered in for the attack and rifles coming to bear aim. This cavalry is committed to the charge and these two lines of men just slam right into each other. And Churchill's reporting on it is just absolutely brilliant. And the thing I realized when you write a book about Churchill is when you try to describe a scene that Churchill himself has written about, it's extremely difficult because number one, obviously Churchill <laughs> was there. Number two, his gift for writing is just, you know, it's on some whole other whole other level. And so, you know, that's one of my favorite newspaper excerpts that I use of his reporting is his description of these two sides clashing. And it was just absolutely barbaric what he describes in, in the in the sort of confrontation that ensues as the cavalry are trying to charge through this wall of men. Churchill discusses killing, I think, three individuals, and he's looking around and he's seeing, you know, fellow lancers getting hacked and speared and horses being stabbed. It's just amazing to think that not only did he go through this, but he actually survived without a scratch. He actually came through without any injury. Well, and one thing was that he went through that battle also. As you know, the tool would have been a sword, but because of Churchill's dislocating his shoulder, getting right. off a ship over in India, yeah. he had to use a pistol. He used a pistol. That's right. Yeah. So he is yeah. literally unarmed, almost. He doesn't have that extra weapon. If that pistol jams or if he runs out of bullets, uh, I don't know if people are able to get the movie version, Young Churchill, but that's an incredible scene where they redo that and they show really what happened there in the Hollywoodized way. But that's incredible. He goes into all that and escapes. And this is how he gets this sense of destiny that we were talking about earlier is who wouldn't think that there was something special about them after going through that? Well, exactly. He writes things when he's on the Northwest frontier, which actually, um, you know, he, he was there before he, he was in the uh, deserts of Sudan, but he writes a letter home to his mother and he says something along the lines of, I don't believe the gods would create a being such as myself for so, you know, crude an ending as being killed in combat. Yeah. <laughs> so, he, you know, he was sort of very aware that he was destined for something great. In, in another letter, he writes, you know, I, I believe I'm destined to do something with my life to save the empire and the English-speaking peoples. Um, and when you read that, he writes that letter in what, 1897. It's astounding that someone can be that sort of in tuned to what they think they should be doing. The one thing, you know, Dean, when I was writing the book and when I was writing about the cavalry charge and some of his experiences on the Northwest frontier and in South Africa is you think how different history would have been if some bullet had found its mark. Yeah, I mean, if, you know, if he hadn't, if he hadn't come through the cavalry charge yeah, or if no he, kidding. you know, had been killed in South Africa, uh, it's amazing to think how different the national landscape would look today. And that's one of the things about him being an embed, as I said, I think that by saying embed, you give an illusion of what we have today where you do have a cell phone, you do your two minute stand up. And I know that you and I both having had careers in news, we've gone on assignment. You have people there, not us, of course, who order room service and pad their expense account. And, you know, want to, <laughs> let's see if I order 500 loaves of toast on ABC's bill, I can build a little toast fort. And, you know, but <laughs> so. This was not on anybody's dime but his own, and I wanted you to explain how his experience here going to these places differed from what we picture today, because we always have to remind ourselves, this is over 100 years ago, even a pampered person doesn't have anything like the luxury, or anything like the basic life we have now. Right. Well, you, you know, when we talk about Churchill as a war correspondent, we also need to keep in mind the fact that he was also at the same time a soldier, and he thought of himself equal parts both. He loved the thrill of combat, but he also derived great satisfaction in writing about his experiences, and one role definitely benefited the other. But of course, you know, even back in Churchill's day, I, I think it was rare for, us, for someone to be soldier and uh, war correspondent. Uh, but of course, not everyone is a Churchill. He took advantage of his family name and his father's connections, and he certainly made things happen. I think when you look at war correspondents today, obviously, you know, the news organization that they work for pays for them to go off to these war zones and, and report accordingly. But Churchill, he had basically three goals in mind with becoming a war correspondent. 
money, fame, and adventure. And so when he started going off to these war zones, he did it of his own accord, sort of paid for it out of his own pocket, or we should say his mother's pocket, since she was the one who had the money. But as he developed a reputation for his reporting skills, then, then papers did start footing the bill for him to go off to these war zones. And I believe by the time he's covering the Second Boer War, he's the highest paid uh, war correspondent in in South Africa. But it is rare for a, a soldier to be reporting on the army that they're attached to. And this did not sit well with a lot of um, folks in the uh, upper reaches of uh, British military command. And, and you know, there are some there are certainly some generals who uh, dismissed Churchill as a glory hound and a metal hunter. And quite honestly, there, there's an element of truth to those claims. You know, Churchill did want to win a Victoria Cross. He was out to sort of build a platform for himself through the glory of of war but in terms of Churchill's experience as a war correspondent very different from what you see today as far as I know you don't see war correspondents today actually taking active part in the fighting obviously they they might be there in the middle of the firefight uh, and reporting what's going on but uh, you know Churchill was gun in hand and was killing enemy combatants and, and taking a very active role in the combat so Churchill's experiences as quote unquote embedded journalist very different and very unique compared to, uh, I think, what we see today. My guest is Simon Reed, and his book is Winston Churchill Reporting, Adventures of a Young War Correspondent. You can learn more at Simon Reed Books on Twitter or at simon-reed.com. Also, don't miss that new website. Today, the day we're recording this, it's just gone live, winstonchurchillreporting.com. There are two dozen photographs and illustrations in the book, too, which helps introduce us to this young Winston half a century before he gave the lion's roar in World War II. And he also goes through World War I, by the way. So this is this is three wars sort of removed from the greatness. And I think you see in your book the little acorn that he grew from here and Really, the heck with his superiors in a lot of things. Not that he was insolent or insubordinate or did anything wrong, but there's that moment where he's on the train, for instance, and the train gets ambushed, right? And he's a reporter. He doesn't sit back and just hide behind a fat man. He takes an active part because he knows it's time to try to save some fellow soldiers. And he really was one of those guys that runs towards the sounds of the gun. And as you said, it's not fair to say that's warmongering, that he had this bloodlust. He knew that those guys were trapped there in that train, and he tr he gets off, he risks himself, he tries to help them, and he ends up getting captured for his efforts, right? But this is really the Churchill that you bring out, that he's this soldier, yes, but he's also a reporter, and he's also his own man, and he... As a young man, for instance, he goes to West Point and he sees the restrictions there on the plebes and he says, well, any any man should rebel against this. An, an animal would, a horse would. They, they have to be there two years without a single day's rest before they're released. And he says, it's so different. And I think that tells you so much about him, right? This is a young man who he wants to be part of it, but he just can't knuckle under what he thinks is wrong, whether it's his Latin teacher trying to force him to learn Latin, right? How to address a table. And he tells him, but what? But I never do. Like, they say, why would I need to know this? Why would I need to say, oh, table? And so you capture so much of that here in the book. Well, yeah, you know, Dean, I mean, you just nailed it a minute ago when you said he's very much his own man. I, I think that's one of the things we certainly remember Churchill for. I mean, obviously, when you think of Churchill in the 1930s making his stand against appeasement and the rising threat of Nazi Germany, obviously, a lot of people dismiss him as being crazy and not knowing what he's talking about. But he shrugs aside that criticism and he just keeps plowing ahead. And certainly we see this also when he's a young man in the British Army. He decides he wants to be a war correspondent and go off in search of fame and adventure. And although there are a lot of superior officers in the British High Command who sort of, you know, are against the idea, Churchill doesn't care. He just does what he wants to do. And I think that is definitely part of his greatness, that he sort of shrugs aside the concerns of other people in pursuit of this ultimate end goal he has. And, you know, I, I think we should also say here, you know, obviously it's very easy to praise Churchill, but he, he was also, he was not a man without faults. He could be a very difficult personality. He could be temperamental. Um, he could sulk if he didn't get his way. 
but um, you know, I, I think that there's a quality of Churchill that a lot of us wish we had, and that is just pursuing our passion relentlessly and going after what we want and knowing what we want and not caring what other people think. And, and th there's got to be something very, very liberating about that. And I'm sure uh, a lot of us wish we could live our lives that way. Yeah, he's a great role model, I think, even if it is for things that he didn't do well, because you can recognize he's honest about them. And so you say, well, I can be that too. I don't have to be defensive. He, he knew, for instance, he had very fair skin. And when he's out in these places, think about these places, folks, South Africa, the Sudan, <laughs> Egypt, right? Cuba, India. What, what do all these things have in common? They're hot and sunny. And he talks about that. It, I wouldn't say it's whining, but he knew this was a physical limitation. His shoulder certainly was a physical limitation that he didn't let stop him. You know, his attitude sometimes at first going back and forth with the rebels and with the Spanish, you know, for, for putting down the rebels. Eventually he comes to realize that he sympathizes with the Spanish soldiers that he's embedded with and sort of comes to be against the rebels. And of course, he's a big empire guy. He didn't want to give up the British Empire. He wanted to hold India. So these are all things that you can say, well, I disagree with that. But I think he was so different in the way he dealt with it. For instance, he meets Mark Twain, right? And he, Mark Twain gives him a really hard time about the Boer War. And Churchill readily admits that he got the better of me, batted me around like a mouse, basically. And I was forced to that citadel, he says, of my country, right or wrong. And Mark Twain said to me, well, that's the case maybe if the poor country is fighting for its life. But in the Boer War, that wasn't the case here. And he admits that. And, and I think that that's because, as you said, we all have faults. And I think that when you read about somebody, it's good when they notice it, too. So you don't feel like, oh, we're just lionizing this gentleman that's so huge all the time. I mean, he certainly didn't want to get captured as a POW. He regretted that, but he talked about it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, Dean, so. I think that that is part of Churchill's greatness. You know, he he was a man with faults. He was incredibly human. And I think his critics, particularly those who, you know, dismiss him as a warmonger or look at him as this heartless thug intent to, you know, save the British Empire no matter the cost, he just wasn't that way. You know, he was certainly enthralled by uh, some aspects of war, but he cried when he heard of soldiers being killed in combat, and he was disgusted with the human cost of war. And he made mistakes. You know, I, I think if he was this faultless individual who, who did everything right and never did anything wrong, there, there'd be no drama in his life. But, you know, he, he screwed up and sometimes screwed up on a grand scale, which uh, in its way adds to the greatness of his story. I, I think it also makes him a more sympathetic figure. As you, you know, you can't sympathize with perfection. Um, you know, and, and Dean, you mentioned uh, earlier some of the places he ventured to as a correspondent and, and the heat. You know, when, when I was writing the book and going over the time he spent in India, I came across a letter that he'd sent home to his mother saying it was 120 degrees in the sun and, and 110 degrees in the shade. And he's sitting on this train crammed full of sweating British soldiers and it's slowly working its way across the baked Indian landscape. To me, the thought is just absolutely horrific because I break into a sweat when it's 85 degrees outside, you know, so I, I don't know how I do in those conditions. Uh, you know, certainly the same thing can be said for his time on the Northwest Frontier. You know, he, he writes a letter home and he's talking about the harsh and miserable conditions in camp and the heat and the savagery of the fighting. But then he also goes on to tell his mother that it's the happiest he's been in a long time. So, you, you know, I, I think when you think of Churchill, you got to think of him as a tough individual, tough both physically and mentally. And, you know, he certainly had a tough skin and could endure extreme discomfort, certainly more than I could. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm with you there. I can't imagine, especially that thing about the skin. I, I don't have the sunburning problem, but I read about that and I read about, for instance, his hands were very small and he would he would wear ladies gloves or trim them down. I guess takes men's gloves and trim them down. And that's hard when you, I find it because I happen to have pretty large hands. Everyone always comments on it, but you know, I could palm a basketball or pick up a huge can or something, and I don't think anything of it. But I notice people who have small hands, they'll struggle with things all the time. And I said, to be out there where their life was so much more physical than ours, go and try to pick up an old telephone, folks, or try to like, take apart and clean a rifle. That was really something he had to overcome, those physical limitations. And, of course, we all know about his speaking. You know, he had to write those down. He wasn't naturally able to just jump right out there and speak. He knew what he wanted to do, though, and he went after it. And I think the fact that we read these excerpts in your book, 
you can really take something away from it. And as you said, you deserve credit too for putting his writing up beside yours in the book. So <laughs> that's, that wasn't an easy thing to do, right? Have people reading him. What do you think people get or what do you hope they get, I guess, out of the excerpts that you select? Because you, as I said, we talked a lot about those and you have to kind of agonize over what to put in and what to put out. And so what do you hope people get from those? What was your Churchill story that you're playing there? Well, what I hope, Dean, when people read the book, you know, and they, and they read the extracts, is that they come away realizing that Churchill, you know, although he's this young man looking for adventure, he, he also has a very human side, and he has a lot of empathy for people, uh, and, and not just empathy for the British soldiers, you know, on, on the side that he's fighting for, but also in many cases, the enemy combatants that he's he's up against. You know, as we discussed, he enjoyed the adrenaline rush of combat, but he was also very much aware of the blood toll of war. And and this does come through in his reporting. And we really start to see it emerge in his reporting from the Sudan following the Battle of Omdurman when he's walking across the desert battlefield and the ground is just littered with Sudanese casualties. And he's absolutely repulsed by it. As he's picking his way among the bodies, he realizes that the wounded have been left among the dead just to rot under the desert sun. And you can see this has a real impact on him. And, it, you know, his attitude of war starts to change. And, and you see this in his reporting. He realizes that it's not just, you know, uh, this wonderful, frivolous game. There is a real price to it. And, you know, when you go back and you look at the campaigns he, he served in before the fighting in the Sudan, you know, Cuba is a little skirmish by comparison. The Northwest frontier is a lot more violent. But what he sees in, in Sudan takes it to a whole other level. So, you know, w when people read the book and they read the extracts from his reporting, I hope that they see, you know, he is a thoughtful individual that, you know, although he understood the necessity of sometimes fighting a war, he wasn't blinded to its costs. And I hope people come away realizing that, you know, there was a layer of emotional depth to him that they might not have realized was there before. I don't think you can help but see that when you read how you frame this and how you pass on just enough of him to hopefully encourage people to go and read more Churchill elsewhere, more of his own books or more books that have been written by him, for instance, by his official biographer, Sir Martin Gilbert, who recently passed away, or God in Churchill recently by Jonathan Sands for this sense of destiny. And our goal here, obviously, was to give people a flavor of Winston Churchill reporting, flavors like Cuban cigars and scotch, of course. And so I wanted to ask you, since we talked so much about young people and Maybe people finding, maybe if they're in their early 20s, a little bit rudderless, like Churchill could easily have been. If you're with that person, the five minute or whatever minutes, two minutes, let's say, conversation in the elevator you had with a young person, you can't open the newspapers right now without reading about some person in their early 20s having trouble, maybe literally throwing their life away, having nobody around. Maybe they don't have a father either, as Churchill didn't at this point in his life. If you had that person and you had the opportunity to put this book in their hands or ask them to get it in their hands, what do you think a person in their early 20s would get out of this? How do you convince somebody to pick up a book on somebody who maybe they think they know everything about Churchill? Um, good question. You know, at the time, we don't really realize it, but our 20s are the last carefree decade we really have to go out and do a lot of things. Most of us at that age, we've just finished school. Uh, we're not married. We don't have kids. We don't have the burdens of a career holding us down to a strict schedule. So it's the last chance we really have to go out and perhaps do a lot of the things we've always wanted to do. Um, last chance to go out and, and travel on a long-term basis to see different places, experience different cultures. You know, the world's a big place and there's a lot to see out there. Um, it, it always kind of saddens me when I see young people today with earbuds plugged into both ears and they're staring at a screen and they're kind of zoned out to the world around them. And so I hope someone, you know, in their 20s who reads Winston Churchill reporting uh, might come away feeling inspired to kind of seize life with both hands and go out there and see what there is to experience. And no less important, obviously, I hope they find it uh, a fun read and an, and an entertaining page turner. Well, I don't think there's many better books that you could read than Winston Churchill reporting for that purpose. I wish I had had it when I was that age. It would have saved me reading about 30 other Churchill books, which I enjoyed. <laughs> but you know, sometimes, let's face it, not all books are created equal. 
My guest has been Simon Reed, who I'm proud to call a friend and whose book I love. And Simon, I feel through full disclosure, I should mention you were kind enough to thank me in your book in the acknowledgments, which was completely unnecessary, but I appreciate. So again, the book is Winston Churchill Reporting, Adventures of a Young War Correspondent. Thank you so much for joining me today, Simon. It was great to finally do this, and it's great to finally be able to hold your book in my hands and to be reading it. So thank you very much for all of this today. Dean, thank you. It's been awesome. Thank you. Again, the book is Winston Churchill Reporting, Adventures of a Young War Correspondent. And as always... You can find the link to purchase a copy of the book at our website, historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through to buy there. We get tuppence every time you do. Once again, thank you, Simon Reed, for joining me today and for writing this book on a relatively unexplored period in the life of the greatest Britain. Please remember to follow Simon at Simon Reed Books on Twitter and visit simon-reed.com for news about Winston Churchill reporting and Simon Reed's other published works of history. And remember, let us know what you think of the book and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or Facebook.com slash History Author. Well, that's it for this week's installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us next time for another trip into the past here on iHeartRadio or wherever it is you're listening. And remember, if you do subscribe to us on iTunes, please leave a review. Thanks so much for listening and happy reading.